Hello guys and welcome to His and Hers Headquarters in Seward, Alaska. Yes, this is our first educational video yeah. from our new studio. Got an amazing backdrop of uh, tokens from our travels. But today's video is going to be 12 questions you need to be asking yourself if you're in the market for or dreaming about an overland expedition vehicle. Number one, who are you? That means, are you solo? Are you a couple? Are you a family? This question really needs to be asked because it determines how much space you need. It also determines the floor plan and layout that would best suit your needs. Make an assessment of what you really need, really need to exist, and what you only want because space is always a premium. Number two, many things pivot around this one very broad question, but where do you want to go? Specifically, where on the globe do you want to go? Do you want to travel around North America or do you have visions of locations abroad? The reason why we're asking is because it determines what kind and size of chassis you need to be looking at. Some parts of the planet are not as conducive to a large vehicle, whereas North America is very welcoming to uh, large vehicles, as everybody has seen by the RVs. Uh, larger vehicles, they come with a lot of compromises, and in cities that were built before vehicles and very tight off-roading situations, they're not as desirable. Number three, are you going to be able to find fuel? So gasoline is found around the world. But for the most part, diesel is the preferred fuel choice for a global overland travel. Not all diesel is equal though. What we're referencing here is the ultra low sulfur diesel. So most engines built prior to 2007, 2008 do not require this more environmentally friendly form of diesel. But the newer vehicles are not designed to run on the high sulfur diesel found in many developing countries around the world and the furthest reaches of the planet. So ultra low sulfur diesel also tends to go hand in hand with DEF fluid. Essentially it's a fluid that is injected into the exhaust to reduce tailpipe emissions. In countries with ultra low sulfur diesel it's easy to find but you get to the edges of the earth and not so much. Ultra low sulfur diesel is very commonplace in the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and most of Europe, many countries in South America as well, so the list is getting longer every year. Now if you have a newer vehicle in mind for your travels, you aren't completely out of luck because there are workarounds to the issues. So you just have to Google it and learn a little bit more about what you need to do for your vehicle. Number four, you know it's gonna happen. You're gonna break down, <laughs> and are you gonna be able to find parts? So if you're on the road long enough, breakdowns are going to happen, and you don't wanna make finding parts any harder than it can already be. Look for vehicles produced by global brands. Let's take Mercedes, for example. They're a quality manufacturer with dealers and aftermarket part sources everywhere on the planet. In the vast options of uh, chassis suitable for global overland travel, you can also find uh, vehicles with a chassis from one manufacturer and the powertrain and drivetrain are going to be from others. For example, the uh, military vehicles here in the U.S. called LMTVs, they uh, have Caterpillar engines and Allison transmissions, both of which have parts and service globally. On another side note, our Mitsubishi Fuso chassis is manufactured by Mitsubishi Truck which is owned by Daimler Auto Group, meaning that we will have increased odds of finding parts. You're not going to be able to be prepared for everything, but with a little forethought, you can avoid a lot of hassle. Number five, when and where do you want to go camping? With that question, let's ask a second one. How necessary is four-wheel drive? Four-wheel drive is awesome. It can take you to amazing places, but about 99% of the time, it's really not necessary. So if it's not that necessary, why pay for the added expense, maintenance, and fuel consumption? 
So that's a really personal question and probably falls right in line with how much do you enjoy off-road and off-grid adventures. We also like to think of 4x4 as an insurance policy because when you need it, you're really glad you have it. Four-wheel drive is not just for off-road adventures, it's also priceless when Mother Nature tries to stop you in your tracks. So having the ability to securely drive through mud and snow is bound to be of benefit if you're on the road long enough. On a side note, don't overlook all-wheel drive vehicles. When combined with decent ground clearance, it's more than adequate for four season and most off-road traveling. Number six, staying right in line with where and when do you want to camp, but let's talk about the camping unit. Yes, that place you are going to be living. So if you want to camp for extended periods of time in extreme hot or cold conditions, you have to be prepared. The emphasis being on extended periods of time because we can all put up with a lot for one, two, or three nights. Considering how hot and cold are opposite, uh, they're addressed quite similarly when it comes to properly equipping your camping unit. Insulation is key. An airtight unit increases efficiency. Dual pane windows are invaluable and you need components to heat and cool the camper box. There's another very important issue to address in regards to winter camping. It's humidity and condensation. Something we've learned is that this happens in every camping unit, no matter how expensive or how well insulated the box is. The problem lies with the human being, beans, and even the dog. Uh, every breath contributes to interior humidity and it needs to be regulated by cracking windows or dehumidifying heaters and uh, there's a few other methods that are worth googling. You're going to have to be aware of problem areas. Corners without good air circulation because of a mattress or seat cushion and the inside of cabinets uh, if they're packed with clothes can all lead to mold if there's a problem that's left unattended. What kind of materials do you want to have for the walls of your camping unit? Generally speaking, you're going to be looking at some options of soft-sided canvas, fiberglass, aluminum, and the um, more highly desired composite walls. There's obviously pros and cons to each material, and we recommend doing further research into this key component of your camping unit. Number seven, and dare I say the most important, what is your budget? Now that we have worked through where you want to go and what you want to do, we have to inevitably talk about money. So you need to know what you want to spend and what is your absolute top number because there's going to be a difference. Ours was 90K for everything. Vehicle flights, postage, personal modifications, shipping the vehicle to our first destination. We wanted to spend around 60 for the vehicle. In the end, we actually spent about 88 just for the vehicle because the right one came along. For most of us, money really is the limiting factor. So you can kind of forget about your overlanding vehicle dream and focus on real world. Uh, what's your budget? and your timeline because if time is on your side you can pounce on the deal of a lifetime when it presents itself if you have the abilities and the tools and the space and the desire you can consider building a camping unit yourself and there's a lot of benefits to a do-it-yourself build either way we guarantee you'll be turning a wrench and working on things if you're going to be traveling in a vehicle so let's return to the camping unit. Um, maybe you've heard of the acronym KISS, the keep it simple stupid. There's a lot of wisdom in that statement. Technology is great, but simplicity is critical. And what we've learned in our years of spending time traveling in RVs and most recently in our expedition vehicle is that Living in a tiny camper might be a challenge, but if it's one that's well thought through, you'll actually come to appreciate the simplicity and efficiency more and more every day. Number eight, what components are you gonna need for your journey? Refrigerator, freezer, heater, hot water heater, air conditioner, etc. All of these components have one thing in common. They're gonna need some type of a fuel source whether it's electricity, propane, 
gas, diesel, uh, there is definitely going to be a fuel source. Electricity can be generated via solar and stored in a battery bank or from an external source like a generator or a good old fashioned electrical outlet. Uh, you need to research to see how accessible propane is going to be along your journey. Uh, from our conversations with fellow travelers, a lot of countries have special adapters. You can find 12 volt refrigerators and freezers. 12 volt is common for the electrical side of most heaters, but an additional fuel source is needed to generate heat. Air conditionings are primarily AC powered. There are some very high end 12 volt ones out there that uh, we would very much like to have in our camping unit <laughs> uh, all in due time. Uh, there are Airtronic and Hydronic diesel heaters. Electric stovetops have come a long way, uh, but we're fans of the diesel ceramic cooktops because they consume minimal electricity and they dehumidify the air as they work. Number nine. Let's talk a little bit more about 12 volt electricity. Traditionally, batteries operate off of 12 volt DC power and it is relatively global. Ideally, you want components that utilize this current so you're not using AC power inverters all the time. Also consider your battery bank. We recently upgraded to 300 amp hours of Battleborn lithium batteries. So considering our solar, and the small electrical footprint of our camper, we shouldn't really have any battery issues for at least a decade. In other words, embrace the 12 volt, and we have said this for years. Install extra USB outlets for charging. They make 12 volt DVD and, and TV combo players. Uh, we've even heard in Europe that Dometic has a 12 volt coffee maker. Number 10, where and how do you plan on sleeping? Sleeping is a reality for human beings and we spend a significant portion of our lives in bed. Now if you're a solo traveler, you only need to be thinking about your own comfort, but if you're traveling with a spouse or uh, even a spouse and kids, everybody has to be comfortable. Here's some things to think about. What direction do you want to sleep? North-South is great because each person can get out of bed independently uh, and without disturbing the other. East-West beds they require crawling over and around the other person uh, and they also are a nightmare to make if they have enclosed walls on each side so everything is all a matter of compromises but you know just keep in mind where are you gonna lay your head at night number 11 if you are going to travel overseas you are going to be shipping a vehicle shipping vehicles is commonly done in shipping containers or on a roll-on, roll-off ship. Shipping containers are obviously cheaper and can be shared, but a vehicle that can fit in one is <laughs> going to be limited in size and probably more expensive. It's a personal decision, but what you need to weigh out is how much money are you actually going to save on shipping versus how many months and years will you be living in this overland vehicle and maybe you'll appreciate the extra space of having a vehicle that has to go roll on roll off number 12 on your journey to find the right overland expedition vehicle there's going to have to be some compromises especially if you're traveling with your spouse <laughs> i can honestly say uh from our last journey of 11 months in a 13 foot <laughs> box i'm lucky she didn't poison me and oh, she's stop. lucky i didn't dump her off into a ditch or roll her off a cliff you shouldn't tell people that <laughs> hey it's the end of the video we have to add a little bit of humor here so unless you have an unlimited budget and a limited scope of travel the perfect camper does not exist focus on your core needs and the journey's core needs and then consider anything else a luxury i have to say after actually living through this process. If you'll start out thinking this is I'm just I'm just packing to backpack around the world and anything extra beyond what I could fit in a backpack is going to be icing on the cake. Then you'll have really perfect expectations <laughs> and maybe avoid a few battles. Cuz really, when you're traveling in these things, there is not much space. <laughs> So a few closing thoughts. Don't get lost in the research. Uh, a lot of people go down this rabbit hole. Uh, don't forget, you need to take some action. Yeah, and 
time is precious. You only live once, so make the most of it. It's an opportunity, go out there and grab a hold. And don't get too hung up on the vehicle, you know? It doesn't have to be perfect. You're gonna make compromises when the right one comes along. Either you're gonna know it or somebody's gonna tell you. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for uh, riding along with us on this journey to help you find the perfect Overland Expedition vehicle for you. Uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button and visit our website, hisandhershub.com, for an amazing interactive experience and a lot more resources. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.